guys, welcome back to another episode of Light It Up Podcast. If you're new to the channel and you wanna know everything about making money in real estate, selling, sales skills, building your business, or investing, then subscribe below and tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. So we've been getting a lot of calls of people asking us how we've hired virtual assistants to scale and leverage our business. So we've opened up our playbook to all of you. If you're looking to add leverage in your business, whether it's administrative support, ISA, outbound callers, Go to adleverage.com and they'll be there to help you staffing your team. Now introducing the best of the best coaches and my personal favorite of all time, Mr. Steve Powers. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. It's a, one of the best podcasts available in North America. Everyone should subscribe and listen to this all the time. Listen to that plug. Love he, it. We didn't pay him to say that, but yes, thank you. <laughs> the bill will be coming. The yeah. bill will be coming. So Steve, you were one of the most viewed episodes that we did. This is the second part. If this is your first one, please click on the link above to watch the first episode that we did with Steve, which was extremely valuable. Um, you were one of the, the most viewed episodes because of the amount of value you provided. And um, you are known for making more millionaires in the real estate business than any other coach that I personally know. So with a lot of changes that we've seen in the last, what, year, and it almost feels like it's a completely different market, if someone took a vacation for a year and came back, they would not realize or recognize the market. Would you agree? Yeah, it, the game has changed. We're playing on a sports field, but we no longer can wear soccer cleats. We, we've got to wear hockey skates or football cleats. It might be a baseball game. We're now showing up to a sports complex and the game changes every day. Mm. So I guess the question that everybody wants to know is how do you stay ahead of these changes and how do you still not have to change your lifestyle? How do you thrive instead of just surviving in this industry? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, what right do you have to believe that you can live with all these changes and not have your life affected? What's I mean, think about this, guys. The game has changed in the NCAA. A couple of years ago, they did the NIL, where college players can now be paid and do transfer protocols. The entire coaching system had to adapt to a player who could then go from your facility for four years, who could leave you and go to another team because of money. Yeah. And the coaches that adapted are making millions. Yeah. Deion Sanders making millions, his program making millions. And those that said, it's not right, we shouldn't pay the college players, their programs are plummeting. Mm. Darwin said it best, adapt or die. Mm. Do you There's see this? no middle ground. Is this any different than, you know, the adapting we had to do during COVID? No, no different, John. You hit it perfectly. Those agents that said, okay, whether I believe in COVID or not, not important. If I think this is real or not real, not important. These are the rules. Mm, right. Wear a mask. I've got to sterilize everything six feet apart. And the agents who embraced it killed. Yeah. And those that went, this isn't right. I shouldn't have to do this. They died. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's adapt or die. And I use a four letter word and it's not the one that starts with an F. It starts with a W. <laughs> w O R K. Mm. All you have to do is work. Right. You'll be you'll make a lot of money right now. There's so much abundance out there right now. Yeah. That's so true. It's the mindset about it because when COVID first happened, I was freaking out and John was like, This is no big deal. And then I was my business was going weird and John was just like, it was it was the mindset. Yeah, I think you just have to sort of I mean, well, I, remember the saying, guys, and I've said it so many times, I believe I own it, but I know I didn't say it originally. There's always cash in chaos. It's true. Rothschild said it. When there's blood in the streets, buy real estate. Mm. Because when people are a little concerned about the economy, their money, et cetera, they cocoon, they, they shelter. And real estate is what we sell, so we sell them shelter. Yeah. There is abundance beyond belief since September of 24, all the way through the rest of this year, if you're willing to adapt and work. I'm, I'm very grateful for you for teaching me and like just going through this from the beginning is like we're always listing focused, never buyer side focused. So it's like you gave a scenario, Steve, earlier today where it's like if you were a buyer and you're in front of a house and you want to see the house, you call in, you're like, hey, I want to see it. And they legally have to make you sign a buyer agency agreement. And they're asking you for 3% out of an $800,000 purchase. They don't know you from Adam and you're asking for 24,000 just to let them in the house, which is, it's very unlikely you're gonna get that signed. Well, yeah, because prior to August 17th or whenever your current state adopted the, the changes, yeah. 
when a buyer said I wanted to see the house, we'd look at the code broker, oh, it's 2.5, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And we'd go show the house to the buyer, sign an agency disclosure so we covered ourselves, who we work for, and the seller was agreeing to pay us 2.5. Mm-hmm. Now, there's nothing in some cases. The agent is, well, the seller says depends on the contract. So now I got to meet the referred buyer. We're standing on the welcome app before I punch the numbers in or put my phone onto the, the uh, keypad. Oh, before I can let you in the house, I need you to hire me. And this is 800000 and the commission is 3%. So you got to agree if the seller won't pay me to pay me 24000 to step inside the house. Yeah. Yeah, the game has changed. Yeah, especially in a business where a lot of those buyers, you know, a lot of times, let's be honest, the first time you're meeting the buyer is at the property, right? The way that a lot of people handle the business, right? Yeah. Like we've all been taught that you should have the buyer come to your office and sign an agreement before you go out and say, this is how I work. And, yeah. you know, if the seller's not willing to pay me, then I'm going to have to collect it from you. Of course, that's how we should yeah. be handling that. Yeah. I've heard a lot of, you know, top buyers agents or agents that work with a lot of buyers say, you know what? Now the rule is just what I've been doing for the last five to 10 years anyway. Yeah. Right. Getting a buyer's agent agreement signed, you know, anyway. is, is, is part of their practice. No. Yeah. Well, just to stay on this for just a wee bit more, as they would say, mm-hmm. we used to see, does the buyer want to buy a home? Are they willing to buy a home this week? Mm-hmm. Are they able to write the contract that gets accepted? Because like when there's multiple offers, uh, they can't be asking for a home warranty and a 60 day delayed closing. So are they mentally, physically, and monetarily able to write the contract? Yeah. Does a bank believe in them enough to give them a pre-approval letter? And now we have to add one thing to this. Do they have the monetary ability to pay me if the seller doesn't contribute part or all? And I want you to think about this. If if the buyer's buying a 400 large home and they're going FHA and they're putting 3% down and they save for two years to get that $12,000 and they got another 5,000 for closing costs, then we say, well, additionally, we need another 12 for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I ain't got it. Yeah. So we better work that out when we take them out because if we take a buyer out, not knowing if we can get paid, our code of ethics says that we're going to be showing them the houses for free. Yeah. Yeah. Because we knew they couldn't pay us and we still move forward. Yeah. Right. It, it's going to separate the people. That's going to cause some buyers to say, hey, if you're charging me 3%, I'm going to go to see it with somebody else who's charging me less. Yeah. They and, do all the time. And yeah. and then what happens is they start submitting offers with that agent who's charging less. And they don't get the deal. And they don't get the deal accepted. And it's just an ongoing cir- circle. But the beauty is that's the chaos. And Steve, that's you, the chaos. Yeah, and yeah. You, you are sharing something that I think is invaluable, especially early adopters, I think will succeed utilizing this, the three-step strategy. Can you share that? Well, real quick, I think one point I want to just um, give Steve credit for this morning when we were yeah. doing our other, um, our other mastermind, you had mentioned... Now more than ever, it's really important for buyers, agents to, you know, give their value proposition mm-hmm. uh, and more specifically, maybe putting the uh, putting a, a buyer's track record together. You know, us as listing agents, we've always talked about putting together a track record of the homes that you've sold and the days on market and, and sell price to list price. Yeah. But I think now more than ever, it's really important for a lot of these buyers agents, especially if you work with a lot of buyers, you know, specifically or exclusively to put together a track record like, hey, these are the last five homes or these are the last 10 homes. And again, if, if, if you're not uh, doing it exclusively, you can use your team's track record. Yep. Here was the days on market. Here's how many offers they got and hours got accepted. Uh, and these are all the ones I've gotten accepted. So just another thing I'd throw out there for people who are you know, trying to find a way to make their buyer's offer stand out. Yeah. yeah John, you hit it perfectly. The buyer agents who now, as of today, treat this like a profession, like a career, are going to have to prove their value and they're going to make a ton of money. And those that still treat it like a job, that show up to a house on Saturday afternoon with wet hair and they got their kid because they were just driving anyway, I was going to let you in the house, they're going to be working for 1%. No. No. I work with a wonderful company who's working on a policy saying that this is the minimum the company will accept. So if you work for less than the 3%, we're still going to get our 1%. Mm. 
because the company can't take all the liability, do all the work for a closing, only to get 1%. You'll transaction yourself right out of business. It's true. Yeah. So it's going to be a huge separator between those that are good at this job and can show value and those that are real estate agents yeah. who can't and they'll work for peanuts and they'll always be those. There are people who shop at the Dollar General who buy supperware because Tupperware costs four times as much. <laughs> but if I could sit down with them for one night and say, microwave your supperware, microwave your Tupperware, let me show you. I've had the same Tupperware for 18 years. I paid $9 for this bowl. It lasted 18. You'll be buying those $2 bowls every month for the rest of your life. But there are people who shop at Dollar General. You can't fix them. Yeah, it's yeah. value versus That's cost. That's who I want to work with. Yeah, that's cool then. Can we shift to listings because listings are where the money is, right? Well, let's yes. do it. With the NAR changes, the sellers are no longer going to be paying through the listing agent, the buyer agent fee, which creates a whole new sets of challenges. Mm -hmm. Again, to cover my butt, Commissions are negotiable. Let's just pretend we're charging 6% today. And you can charge whatever you want out there. It wasn't uncommon someone would charge 6%, give away two, keep four. Yep. And then when the seller would argue they want to drop it down to five, well, okay, I charge five, keep three, give away two, still making three. Mm -hmm. But we no longer have the 654 debate. It is quite clear now to the seller. They don't need to pay a buyer agent fee. That part is off. Gone are the days when the seller says, Kiro, John, why 6%? Oh, Mr. Seller, I don't get the whole 6%. I give almost half of it away. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Problem goes away. Yeah. Now it's, you guys want 3%. Bob Smith said he would charge two. This is a million dollar home. There's a $10,000 difference. Tell me what I get for $10,000. Hmm. Because we're only charging a listing commission, the seller has clarity in dollar figures between the difference now, doesn't he? Yep. And we better have an answer for that $10,000. We better have a value proposition that says to the seller, darn, I got to hire these people. These people can make me more than 10000 by charging them. We need to have a value marketing plan that just rocks. And we need to have objection handlers. Like a professional golfer does chipping mm. close to the hole. This is going to separate those who know what they're doing and those who don't. And those who don't are still going to get listings at 2% with a 1% buyer agency fee. And they're going to transaction themselves right out of business. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. So how does someone show value and get capture more market share in with the given circumstances in the marketplace now? The market shares comes from taking listings. Yep. Everybody says, well, I want to capture market share. You capture market share by capturing clients, by doing your job better than anyone else. And it's like Toyota. In 1969, they brought over Toyotas and GM laughed at them. They would buy the Toyota. There were street signs used on the floorboard because they didn't have any metal. And they were stripping street signs to make the floorboards. Oh, these people are crazy. But Toyota was working on quality. And then six years later, we had the energy crisis. Everybody wanted to buy a Toyota. And then 10 years after that, Toyota makes more money than GM, Chrysler, and Ford combined. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the market share if you work on your quality. Mm -hmm. If you work on your professionalism, the market share will come because of the number of signs you put up, the recognition, and the number of repeat and referral business. Yeah. But it goes back to being able to set appointments and then get the properties listed. So in today's world, we believe at Watson Powers Coaching, you have to do three things on every listing appointment now. Hmm. Number one, your first is to get the price right. And don't discuss anything until you settle on the price. Don't discuss open houses. Don't discuss marketing. Don't discuss your be here for every showing. No sign, no lockbox. You have to be really good at diverting those things because once you have the price that the seller and you agree to, 
you now know how saleable that listing is, correct? Correct, absolutely. Without that price, you're talking about ambiguity things. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how fast this house will sell, so now I can't show what I can do to sell it. So the first thing we have to do is better than ever, help the seller come up with a price that will help sell the home. Yeah, and just to take a step back on that for a second, we've all been on those appointments where you've sat down at the table, mm -hmm. probably not following the proper framework. Yep. Maybe you didn't have the coaching or maybe you did and you just decided not to follow it. But you sit down and you get in that trap of talking about, oh, well, how many open houses are you gonna do? And, and, yep. and uh, are you gonna do the professional photography? And you talk about all this nonsense for 45 minutes, an hour, and finally then you get to talk about price and you are so far off, so far off on price that you just wasted an hour talking about stuff that doesn't even make sense. Yeah. So. Well, well, John, you're an experienced agent, so you've noticed that when you start to go down the price path and the seller wants here, but the reality is here, and they start to see that you're starting to, to funnel down to a price they're not happy with, have you ever noticed that they try to divert you with questions about what's your commission, what's your open house policy? Will you be here for every showing? Of course. Because they don't want to talk about what, John? Price. So they try to divert you to come up with a reason not to hire you based on, I don't like where the pricing is going. Let me find a reason to have you leave my house. <laughs> yeah. Let me poke holes in something else. Yeah. yeah. And you can tell because they lean back. <laughs> Cross their arms, yeah. sometimes fall out of their chair. You know they don't like the price. Yeah. So, John, what do you do when a seller says, well, hold on on the price. John, what do you think about open houses? You know, great question. Uh, uh, what's, what's your opinion of open houses? Oh, we love them. We bought this house for an open house. We sold our last house from us. My mother demanded her agent hold the open house. House sold in a day. Wow. Okay, great. So you've had a lot of great experiences with open houses. It sounds like uh, we'll put a note here to, to discuss open houses. Now, Steve, let's go back to the price here. Are we on the same page about price? There you go. Did you see that, guys? Why this is the greatest podcast ever? <laughs> Most of the time, real estate podcasts that you go on, the people aren't active. So they don't really know what they're doing. They're not in the game. So good job. See, the idea is that the seller is going to try to divert you about anything but the price. So the first thing we have to get great at, because good is no longer good enough, mm -hmm. is helping the seller come to the agreement where the most a buyer would pay for the home is. And once we agree on that, then our second job is to get hired at a marketing listing commission that makes sense for a profit. Which means we can't have a marketing plan that talks about things that don't show a lot of value. But three months ago, they did. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put a sign in your yard. We're going to have a wonderful lockbox access. Three months ago, that was great value. But the seller now sees 2% of a million, 3%. Where's my 10 grand? Mm -hmm. Putting a sign in my yard, I don't see 10 grand. I'm getting a sign with the other person. You're going to put a lockbox. Everybody has a lockbox. Where's my 10 grand? Yeah. Yeah. So we better start taking some of the things for granted that we used to do and be Ritz Carlton about them. Our photographers better be the best. Our drone flyovers for the appropriate house better be with people who know how to fly a drone, not your kid who has a drone. <laughs> your stager, if you're using a stager, better be the best stager out there. Why? Because when I'm selling a Ferrari, I don't get it detailed by a car wash next to an Exxon station. Yeah, right. Everything has to be level five on what you provide if you want a full commission. Yeah. So the first thing we have to do is we got to get really good at helping the seller come to agreement on price. And once they agree on price, we know how much, how fast, yeah? How much the house will sell for, how fast it'll sell. Yep. Then we have to be really good at explaining why pay us this much more than our competition, why supperware is not as good as Tupperware. Yeah. <laughs> Why you need to shop at Nordstrom's, not the Dollar General for your next suit. Yeah, right. Because from 100 yards, they look the same. A Hyundai and a Mercedes from 100 yards look equal. But when you drive them, they're totally different. Yeah.
Yeah. And then the third part is after you get the price, after you get hired at the listing commission you're happy with, the third part is to then discuss if the seller wants to contribute towards the buyer agency fee. Mm. And sometimes they don't want to, right, guys? That's right. Yep. And it's okay because legally they don't have to, do they? Nope. But if I have a property that's priced here and it should be here, and I have a commission that's here and it should be here, well, the only way the thing is going to be sellable if if the seller is willing to contribute. Yep. But if he's not willing or she's not willing to contribute, then why would I take the listing? Yeah, right. However, if the seller is willing to price it here and it's here, and my commission is right where I need to be, and I know this thing is going to sell in 10, 14 days, I don't care if they give money away or not. Yeah. I'm not going to fight the seller over a buyer agency fee that may or may not be needed. Yeah. Because my competition is going to have the R badge. <laughs> and they're going to go, well, as a realtor, I think it's fair for my fellow brethren that we give something away. I don't think it's fair how they changed everything. And the seller doesn't play fair. The seller wants somebody who works for them. Yeah, that's true. So if you got the right price, you got the right commission, and the seller's not willing to give away a fee, I'll deal with it later. If it doesn't sell, I'll bring it up. Yeah. Mr. Seller, if your front door was needed painting, would you paint it? Yes. If it needed a new roof, would you put a new roof on it? Yes. If it needs a buyer agency fee to attract a buyer, would you be willing to pay it? It's the same thing. Yeah, it is. Don't walk away from a listing because the seller is not willing to contribute if it's priced correctly and you got a full commission. Yeah. It's a new game in town. Yeah. Because at that point, you know, you're speaking to somebody you already have an agreement with, right? Rather than speaking with them about trying to convince them to pay a buyer's agent before you have the agreement signed. Yeah. Yeah, Does see, that make sense? I would recommend that you get your listing agreement signed and then discuss the buyer agency it's, fee. Right. Because now I got it, put it away. Okay, that that's mine. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about something extra. Let's talk about the clear coat and the mud flaps. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, the, the way that Steve worded it to me, which resonated really well, is like once you have the listing locked in, then you could say, "Hey, can I share with you the pros and cons of sharing out a commission with yeah. the uh, with the other agent, with the the buyer uh, contributing to the buyer agency uh, uh, agent, whatever." Um, and then you relate it to, well, if a property needs a new roof and it costs 15,000 for the roof, do you think the buyer is going to ask for a credit of maybe 15, maybe 20,000? Yeah. Of course. So wouldn't they do the same thing with the commission, right? right. Yeah. But you do this after you get the signature and it's yours. Yeah. You own the listing. Because if you start fighting for a buyer agency fee and they go, ah, we need to think about it. You just walked away from a saleable listing because you were trying to get money for people who don't work with you. Yeah. It's, um, I remember when I was younger, a few years into the business, or maybe just a year into the business, whenever it was, I would go on appointments and sellers would ask me, is there anything we need to do to get the house ready for sale? Mm. And I would say things like, you should paint the living room, you, because, you know, the, the, the roof's got a big hole in it. I'd say, you should probably patch the roof, you should do all these things. And there was times where I lost the listing because, because I was explaining that. to the seller, I was giving them all this homework before you got the listing. Sale. Right. And I'm talking myself out of the deal. So it's almost similar to that in a way where it's like, hey, listen, if they're on board about price and they're on board about paying me my commission, let's get it signed. And then I can talk to them about all the other, those other Here's things. Here's some that, options, some add-ons yeah. you might want to consider. If they say yes, Yahoo. If they say no, I'll deal with it later. I got the listing. Yeah. Remember, I can always give it back. I can't always get it back. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's well said. Well now, said. one of the things, Kara, that you and I talked about was right now we're in a honeymoon period mm -hmm. where the seller was so used to paying five, six, seven percent. So when you come in there with your listing fee of three percent, they're like, anything less than six is great. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the agents that I coach are asking 3.5, 3.6, 3.8, because anything under four, the seller's like, well, this is cheap comparatively. Yeah. So they're giving the listing agents, and we're coaching them out a little bit, on how to get 3.5, 3.7, 3.8, because the seller's like, 3.8 is nothing compared to six, I'll pay you. Yeah. And they're hiring us at now 3.8 on the listing side. It won't last forever, but you should be thinking about it. If you're providing a better service, you should charge for it. Yeah. I, and one thing that I think needs to be noted is that we need to role play these scenarios like crazy because I had an, a, a lead that I booked an appointment for on Friday. 
one of her questions, she calls me back after I pre-qualified her and then had everything set up. She calls me back. She's like, what's your commission, by the way? I'm like, it's 3%. She's like, 3%? I'm like, yeah, 3%. She's like, who pays the other agent? I'm like, well, you're not obligated to anymore. We'll talk about it when we meet in person. I only said the number because I, she was one of those people that you needed to know. And then she got even more turned on. She's like, okay, yeah, let's let's do it this time. Can you say to me, what do I pay the buyer agent? Well, Steve, what do you pay the buyer's agent? Well, Carol, that's up to you because you own the house, right? Yeah. You're in control, aren't you? I guess I am. C at four. C at four. See, I got two yeses in a row. Yep. Well, Carol, that's up to you because you own the house, right? Yep. Because, so you're in control, aren't you? I am. Because I got two yeses in a row, I can get an appointment. Yep. See you today at four. Yeah, I like that. That's good. There you go. So what else should someone know? So in the honeymoon phase, that's something that they're not aware of. What else do you think is a value add or something that can be monopolized, especially in this early stage now for early adopters? Well, it's everything. I mean... Our photographer is award winning. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, we're going to take pictures of your home, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, our photographer, her name is Caroline, is going to call both of you and hopefully meet one or both of you at the house. She'll spend an hour to an hour and a half at your house. Mm -hmm. She's going to be out here twice. Number one, she'll be out here in the morning when the sun's on the front of your house. Number two, she's going to come back in the afternoon when the sun's on the back of your house. Is it okay that we pay a photographer to make sure your house looks perfect. Yeah. She'll spend an hour inside the house with you, moving some things around. It's your stuff. We're not going to touch it. We want you to do it to make sure your house looks perfect. Have you ever gone on Zillow, Realtor.com, and you look at two similar houses and one looks glamour shots and the other looks like somebody took their pictures with an iPhone 13? Yeah. Or glamour shots. Yeah. <laughs> My photographer will take 250, 300 pictures. We're going to decide the best 30, 32. We're going to make your house pop. Speaking of pop, John, are those pavers in your front driveway? They are. Cost me a now, lot of did money. Did you put them in or did you have that? Were they there when you bought them? Oh, I put them in. Smart. Now, I'm not aware of too much, but I believe they don't give pavers away. Fair statement? That's, that's true. Yeah, they were expensive. You ever notice how pretty they are when it rains? I have noticed that, actually. Because the water gets absorbed and the true color comes out. That's what you paid for, yes? That's right. This is why people like you hire me, John. Our photographer gives a hug, gets a hose provided by me. I pay for this. They're going to wet down your pavers before they take the pictures because we want your pavers to pop. Yeah. yeah. John Kiro, have you guys ever seen those HGTV pictures, uh, shows, DIY shows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they show the deck before and they show it after? Of course. Yep. Have you ever noticed the after pictures are always wet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're going to pay our photographer to make everything wet. Mm -hmm. Those little bubbles of water are going to make your house stand out. Mm -hmm. Is it okay with you when you hire me that we do this to the nth degree to the photographer level? Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine what we do on every other level? Mm. It's, it's. I can do this for an hour. Yeah. Do you believe I can sell your home and not leaving anything on the table? Yeah. It's interesting. There's there's a lot that we do. Like some people might hear you say that, Steve, and say, oh, wow, you, you know, he's just uh, embellishing it. But there's a lot that we do at a very high degree already. Yeah. But we don't give ourselves credit for it. Yeah. Like right? the CO process in New Jersey. Like the CO process, the fact that we handle the smoke and the CO for the seller. Um, you know, especially if you find out that that's like they, they don't live in the area and that's something that would be of benefit to them. Um, but even things players. like, um, you know, uh, just whatever it is, like, like we put booties at all of our listings, right? So that people aren't, you know, traipsing, traipsing through the house and they're dirty well, there shoes. You go. Are these, these beautiful hardwood floors, when did you guys have them finished? Uh, last year. Did they give that away? No, it was expensive. One of the reasons that wonderful people like you hire me is we protect our hardwood floors. So if it's okay with you, at my expense, we're going to have a booty machine where every agent, every buyer will step in as a cool little vacuum thing goes, and it puts a protection <laughs> on their boots yep. so that your floors are saved from the traffic. More importantly, your buyer, knowing that you care that much, are they going to probably pay you a little more? Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. Isn't that why you hire me? Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? 
What, what I'm saying though is people do that stuff already. They just don't explain it to the seller because yeah. to them, it's everybody normal. does it or it's human. You know, it's it's just part of the process. We don't do it. We don't give ourselves enough credit to say, you know, I am spending more. I, I could pay a photographer twenty five dollars, but I'm paying the photographer two hundred and fifty because he's a lot better. Yeah. So give yourself credit for the things that you're you're already doing. You just have to find a way to show show the the value. And you got to sell it, John. Yeah, you got to sell gotta it. Next, those booties up. <laughs> you just can't say we're going to put a booty machine so your floors are protected. Yeah. Okay. These are not the booties from Dollar General. These are the booties. No, from- <laughs> these aren't yeah. supperware booty generals. Okay, but you you've got to take what you're selling and sell the heck out of it. Yeah. Because again. When you're charging 3.5% on a million dollar house, the sellers can do the math. Yeah. That's 35,000 large. Yeah. And when somebody's charging 2%, that's 20. Yeah. Where's the 15,000? Yeah. Yeah. And I've got to have, as you said earlier, John, the MLS statistics to show my value. Yeah. Now here's the key guys. And I'm giving a coaching point away, but it's okay. You have to, to ask the question, Kiro, John, if I can prove to you now, give you the evidence you need, 100% convince you, by paying the 3.5% commission, you'll actually net more than you would by charging two. Mm. If I can prove that to you right now, will you hire me today? Mm-hmm. I love that one. Yeah. And what am I waiting for? A yes. yes. Not a maybe. What I can't move forward is, what do you got? Show me. Let me think about it. Maybe. Because none of those is a yes. Yeah. I can't move forward to both husband, wife, both partners say that magical word yes because they have an escape hatch on a maybe. Mm-hmm. And then I better be able to prove $15,000 of the value. Right. Yep. But once I do prove it, you know, Kara John, you guys are both nurses at the hospital, yes? Yep, yes. You know what's great with working with professional nervous and nurses? You are men of your word. Because in your profession, when you don't keep your word, People bad dash. things happen, don't they? Yep, very bad. Because you thought about a time that you didn't keep your word or somebody else didn't. Mm-hmm. Earlier I asked you if I could prove to you that by charging a full commission, you would actually make more money than 2%, would you hire me? You both said yes. Mm -hmm. I assume you're both men of your word. Mm. That's good, I like that. It's called a close. It is a close. Boom. Do you guys both mind if we do a little bit of a deviation uh, on the topic? So Watson Powers, you guys are real estate coaching for business. And one thing that I don't think people will consider, but this literally just happened to me, Steve, so I will tell to you about it on our next call. Um, Making sure that their contracts with their agents are ironclad, because if they're going to get desperate, they're going to try to circumvent you as any in any way possible. So do you mind going on for team leaders, things that they should be aware of to make sure that they are protecting themselves with their agents? So many of our wonderful clients have buyer's agents on their teams. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gordon's team has 20 agents. They are going to do 600 deals. They, they average three deals a month. You got to protect yourself because you run a business. Mm -hmm. If you own an NFL team, there's contracts with the players. There's contracts with the coaches. So independent contract agreements, you got to be aware of a couple of things in every state that I'm aware of. If you put a non-compete clause, you're virtually guaranteeing your contracts voided. Mm-hmm. Many years ago, the wonderful state of Nevada threw out the non-compete clause. And basically every other state said, you can't do it. Now, can you guard your secrets? Sure. But you can't stop an agent from leaving you for whatever reason and going across the street. Yeah. And then saying they can't work in real estate. But what you can do is put in a nasty referral clause. Mm-hmm. In the event that you decide to depart and any person that we gave you as a contact lead, et cetera, works with you or the team that you go to, you agree to pay our company, our team, 75% referral fee. See, I buy these leads and I give them to the buyer's agents. The buyer's agents and the buyers become friends, but I pay for that. Then when they get enough of them, some will think, I can go out and do this on my own. And they take all the contacts that I own, that I paid for, and pretend they're theirs. 
I can't stop the buyer who became friends with the buyer agent from calling the buyer agent, hey, Sally, I want to sell my house, but I can be paid a referral fee. Yeah. And the board of realtors will back me up on that. If you have any questions, give me a call on it. It's very important. One of our long-term clients won $250,000 from their buyer agent who tried to screw them. Yeah. Number two, I believe your contract should end on, Jan on December 31st every year, that the contracts, when you renew every year for January to December for the next year. We recommend that you have a negotiation period in there. We say the 10th of December to December 21st, no exceptions. Yeah. So the negotiation period is during the holiday season when things are theoretically slow for most people. So if an agent and I are having an issue, let them depart during the slow time. But you also want to put in there no exceptions. Any attempt to renegotiate contract outside of the said period could be taught cause for termination. And without 60 days notice, well, then the clause comes in where I get to keep 80% of their pending income. Mm. This stops that hallway negotiation. Hey, John, we need to talk. I haven't sold anything. Now I have five things under deposit. I think my split's too low. <laughs> Just when they start to make you money, they want 90%. Mm -hmm. Right. So you need to have a good independent contract agreement. We can help you with that. But then you have to have your state attorney review it because the laws are a little different in each state, how you have to use the vernacular. But those are a couple examples how we're real estate coaches for business. We are we teach people how to run profitable business. Gordon's had his team five years. Five years. Yep. He's number one in Oklahoma, large team, number eight in the nation. I'm jealous as heck. My buddy, my best friend, my partner in Watson Powers, I go to his house to go to work. I'm ready to go to work at 5 a.m. We don't get to the office till 8.30. <laughs> we stop, he brings his dog, we have breakfast. He's like the mayor of Norman, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. We get to the office at 8.30, his dog Sissy runs around. I'm chomping at the bit to work. He meets with some agents, then he has a meeting at 11 o'clock till 12. Then they disperse, then he works on Watson Powers. He works four days a week in the morning, 8.30 to 12. Yeah. 60 deals a month. God bless him. Most of his agents, 50-50 splits. Yeah. It's a great world. It is a great world. <laughs> <laughs> what I would do to be Gordon. Yeah, no, that's that's extremely valuable, especially with when times get tough, people act crazy, and especially if they're trying to bypass certain things. So making sure you're protecting your butt is super. I was calling John and venting to him earlier about it. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I should have had it in writing. But I had it recorded, so I didn't think it was that big of a deal, blah, 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 blah. Um, but you have to, like, literally, you could trust, but you have to verify and verify in writing. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the way it works. Yeah. You're probably going to cut this part out, but Diddy said he found out after 18 years, none of those kids were his. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Oh, God. Um, and Steve, I guess last point we can go over. What are you seeing in the successful teams that are thriving right now that – can be adopted or should be adopted by uh, smaller teams or you know teams that aren't really exposed to uh, what you guys are doing? First of all, I coach this wonderful, wonderful leader in California, and I made him watch the movie Patton. Mm -hmm. General Patton was a general in World War II, and General Patton was known to be a bit of a confident guy. And one of the reporters said to him, well, General, do you think the Nazis are going to hell? And he said, well, that's not my decision. That's the decision of the Almighty. Uh, my job is to arrange the meeting. Hmm. Somebody said, General, why do you never retreat? And he said, I don't like to pay for the same ground twice. Hmm. I don't want to write a mother and tell her her son died recapturing land we already had. Also, it's really hard for the enemy to fire at you when they're running away. Hmm. And people wanted to be in Patton's army more than anybody else. They worked harder. They covered more miles. They were tired dog ass. They, they just decimated the enemy. He covered more ground with human beings than anybody ever. And yeah. why did people want to be in Patton's platoon? Because everybody knew less people died in Patton's platoon than any other platoon. Mm. If you're a leader and you're strong and you're charismatic and you've got a system, the agents will flock to you because they want leadership. Mm. 
They want someone who has a system, who's confident. The gentleman I'm talking about in, in Los Angeles, outside of Los Angeles, he is a confident, veneer teeth, beautiful human being. Mm -hmm. Just he exudes confidence and he can sell anything. And he outworks every one of his agents. Mm. If you're a leader that you're not pulling that chain, if you think you can push it, you're dreaming. Yeah. You've got to outwork your agents because all of them are scared right now. They don't know what to do. You got the answers. You just got to show them confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. That's, that's what great. they're looking for. No, that's good. That's great. All right. Well, Steve, is what's the best way for someone to reach out to you if they want to connect, consult, see if they're a good fit? My phone number is 757-719-4329 or steve at watsonpowers.com or call Gordon or call Sydney, a wonderful, great coach. Call any of us. The great thing about Watson Powers is you can have whatever coach you want. We're here to help you. It's a partnership. Yeah. And I, I can I can vouch for that. Steve complains I don't call him enough. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I rare I, to hear a coach say that. Yeah. He's like, you don't call me enough. What, what's, what's up with that? I'm like, I'm sorry, Steve. I, I save it for Wednesdays. <laughs> well, so, well, like this call, this Friday, and I've announced all my coaching clients, it's free coaching Friday. Yeah. I'll be working here at my lake house all day on my coaching material. We have a wonderful event in, in, uh, in the end of September at the uh, Princess Scottsdale Summit, and I'll be working on that. So I tell everybody, I'm available for 10 hours on Friday. Call me. And there's mm -hmm. no charge. We don't consider it a 30-minute call. Thank you for your money. I'll talk to you next week. We consider a partnership. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you much for that. That's awesome. Well, Steve, thank you so much for always being on. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Love having you on always.